Hi, everyone. We're going to give everybody a few minutes to uh, kind of filter in. Welcome to the spring 2023 Etchell's webinar. Uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, primarily, well, all on the West Coast and specific, specifically uh, San Diego. Uh, while everybody's filtering in, we want to remind everybody to uh, pay your class dues, both locally and internationally. I know in order to be uh, in the world and the North Americans coming up, Eric and I both had to pay our dues, and it's really important for us to uh, support the class so we can go to these uh, high-level regattas, and the class always has enough resources to put on good events. So. Um, I'm Alex Curtis. I'm located in Newport Beach, California. I'm joined by Eric Doyle, who's Mr. Worldwide. Uh, Eric, are you there? And where are you uh, tuning in from today? Hey, hey, Alex. Good to see you, man. Right now, I'm tuning in from the uh, north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, down south, the yachting mecca of Mandeville, Louisiana. Great, great. Eric uh, is based out of San Diego and ran the production out of the loft for a number of years. And now he just kind of floats around and sails and his whole mission in life is to make boats go faster. Uh, Eric did a pretty good job of that this past weekend in Miami, where both of us sailed the uh, last event of the uh, Etchell's winter series, the midwinters, which was a three day event. Um, it was primarily kind of flat water and light air, which is a condition that we see all the time in San Diego. Eric, why don't we, we're just gonna kind of dive right in. Um, we're gonna talk about the mains first and how to trim your main and get the boat properly set up and get the right amount of power. Eric, why don't you talk to us about how to trim your main in flat water and light air when you're trying to go fast forward or when you're trying to point? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a great, uh... Great uh, final regatta in, in uh, Miami this past weekend, primarily about six to 11 knots. Uh, there was a couple of times we were, we were at our base setting, you know, everybody's pretty, pretty confident that they, they have a good solid base setting, you know, 19 on the caps, nine on the lowers. Uh, a lot of the times we were a little looser that maybe one turn off the caps and, and two turns off the lowers, you know, just enough that the lowers were, were letting the mass hit against the partners pretty hard we were a lot of we we didn't hike a whole lot it's also a pretty typical scenario in san diego especially first race of the day first beat where we're we're trying to juice the boat up get the boat going and we're we're trying to make the sails you know full but not too full you know we're trying to find the as we see over there how much do we pull the traveler up so that we power up the boat, but we don't have it so high that it's just so draggy. You know, we, we want to have, we want the sail to work all the time. You know, there's, there's kind of three modes in the Etchells I like to think of. When it's really light air, we've got crew in the boat. <clears throat> there's really not enough wind to load the sail properly and, and start to distort it. You know, we're using Dacron. It's a it's old school. It's not like new carbon sails that you see on the big hot race boats. So when the sails, so the sails always stretching unless there's not enough pressure on it. So when it's really light, we're actually trying to flatten the main a little bit. Uh, we've got some little slides later with some more technique to show you about that and signs to look for, you know. And then there's a then there whether there's a little wind range above that. Where, we're, where the sail is starting to load, it's starting to distort a little bit and get its true flying shape that we have most of the time. So that's where we're trying to find the balance. We're trying to figure out how high to pull the traveler so that we get the crew up on the rail, we get the boat loaded and heeled over. You know, and then once we get to that, that's when we're at our base setting kind of, you know, anything when we're crew in the boat, we're on our low setting when we're crew on the rail, everybody's sitting there comfortably hiking sometimes. That's usually a pretty good sign. You've got to be at your base setting. And then there's a wind strength above that. When we're, we're so overpowered, we're hiking all the time, the boat's starting to flip over. How do we depower it? You know, how do we get the boat to stay on its feet? It doesn't have too much helm. 
without easing the sales too much, you know? So we're, and a lot of times uh, this past weekend, it wasn't terribly shifty, but there were a lot of puffs and we had a transition between the two where the crew was, it would get lighter and lighter and the skipper has the best feel. He calls for a little bit of weight in because he can't drive the boat that well. And then suddenly the sail's getting too full, you know? And then there were times where the puff came and we want to hike into it right away. We don't want to be easing stuff too much. And there were a lot of times too, where we were kind of, you ended up out on an edge and you wanted to go forward on a guy. So how do we go forward? We got to make the sail a little bit flatter. We got to unload the helm a little bit. You know, and we do that with a, a lower traveler, a firmer sheet, and we might ease the main sheet just a little bit so that it looks like it does when it's really light air. When it's light, when there's crew in the boat and we look up at that top telltale, we want to see the telltale flowing more than 50% of the time. That's got to flow. We've got to see it. We, we want to get power out of the boat by tuning the rig properly and having the weight proper, but not. It, it's easy to kind of trim the sheet in and try and heal the boat over and go. But a lot of times if the sail's stalling too much, it's just kind of going high and slow. And then a lot of times maybe we get a little stuck. We're on a somebody lee bows us or right off the starting line. We didn't get a great start or the guy's just under our bow. He's he's within a length of us and we can't tack. And it's like, oh, how do we how do we stay here? You know, and that mode is a little higher traveler and a sheet just a little bit. And just understand if that guy's down there, you're you're kind of waiting for an opportunity to get out of there. If the guy can go down more in the rumble mode, he, he's going to gain VMG in the long run. He's going to leg out on you. You might live there for a minute or two and think, oh, I'm doing just fine. But you you basically need some help if that guy's down there. Underneath. You need the breeze. You need to have a little more wind than that guy or the wind be shifting to the right. But eventually he's going to get to you. He's going to leg out. If you got to stay, it's a big wind shift or you're on the ley line and you don't want to do two tacks. You know, that's how you're going to set the boat up. Yeah. And I think the crew dynamics through all of this is really important. Like you said, there, I, I don't know. I thought there was a lot of shifts this weekend, but definitely the pressure differences were quite big on the race course. And a lot of times you were tack, you know, you always had to tack in a puff and, um, and if you tacked in a lull, it was a big, big change, but in a straight line, when you're going from a, a lull uh, to a puff, you have to change a lot. You got to change the traveler, the backstay, the main sheet it becomes overwhelming and so the, you know you still want to adjust the big lines first adjust the main sheet and the traveler first and then from there you can get the boat settled and decide okay do i need to add a little bit more backstay can we hike this flat you know what did my sails look like so on and so forth if you look at these two pictures one of the things that i really try to focus on is the bottom draft stripe here and trying to keep the bottom draft stripe in pretty similar spots relative to center line. And then uh, work a lot on boom angle. Like I know when you were helping us and the Argyle program, we talked about the boom position relative to center line and kind of keeping the boom in the same place over and space, over yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the same space, you know, really good main trimmers. They, they can do that. So the boom itself, you know, yeah, they're, they're in a little bit different spots, but in general, you know, this, the leech on the left is firmer. The boom is a little bit lower, but it's still in the same place. This, the sheet is a little softer uh, uh, on the right-hand side with the boom a little bit higher, but the boom is still kind of in that sort of like four inch range. And the crew dynamics are really important because it's hard to trim the main and know what's coming next. We're very fortunate. We sail with four people on the boat. We designate Jesse Kirkland, who's our strategist, to always be calling the wind, you know, allowing the driver and the main sheet and the jib trimmer uh, to know what's coming to be able to accurately trim the sails. So I think that that was a big thing that we learned this weekend. And as you alluded, the first race in San Diego, you get those big pressure differences. And a lot of times it's lighter at the bottom end of the course and windier at the top end of the course. And you have to transition through a bunch of different shapes and profiles, you know, to, to sail the whole race course. So use the whole team and use the big ropes first, I think are, are kind of my two big takeaways. Um, here's an example of uh, the Club Rosé. Uh, this is uh, Tom Carruthers. 
Um, he was sailing with Madro and Jeff Reynolds at the time. He's now sailing with Billy and Jeff. They're doing a great job. They were just second at the in the whole series. They spent a lot of time. Um, but this is another great example of, of the boom uh, relative to centerline. Booms just above centerline with the traveler a little bit higher. Guys are hiking hard. What What's your big takeaway from just kind of looking at this image, Eric? Yeah, I, I, I like this. I think I... I think I may have actually taken this photo on a tuning day. You know, we were a little bit closer to Point Loma and you can see the water's pretty flat. There, there's not a big giant ground swell like we get a lot in San Diego. So, and the breeze is just coming up a little bit here. You can see the lured lower is a little bit slack and the upper is, is still engaged. So they're, they're probably at their base setting. The boys are just starting to hike. And I guess the, the thing, this is a condition where you're you're sheeting the main sheet pretty hard to to get the boat the to get the boat tracking and and powered up, and as a result, you can see his boom the lower side of his boom is just above center line, so he's he's not too draggy because we don't we don't need a lot of big power and a lot of twist to get through the waves. You know the boat's going to be relatively easy to sail in this condition, so we want to keep it low drag. We want the boat. It's probably pretty much up to hull speed. You know, it's it's going well. Tom's probably leaning out in the big puffs and just kind of relaxed in the light ones, in, in the light spots. You know, you can see he's got just the tiniest bit of weather helm. You see his tiller just pointing to weather. So that to me is just it just looks perfect. You know, the rudder needs to have a little bit of angle to work to create lift. We've got a little bit, but not too much. We don't need a whole lot in this uh, in this situation. You know, we end up with a little more when it's windy or when the waves are bigger because the boat is, as we can see in this picture, we see how big and wide and round. And we know the boat's got a lot of surface area and it's got a, it's very heavy boat and it, it needs power. So there's times when we have a little more helm and a, and a little bit more heel, but he's got beautiful heel. And looking at the, the you can't quite see up the main too much, but the bottom of the main and the bottom of the jib, you know, the exit angles of both of those are very similar. And I bet if we looked at the top of them, the twist would be the same too. We, we want to get everything to work together, you know, from the, from the crew, from the helm, from the top of the sails, the bottom of the sails, the rig tune. And that's, as we know, we've, they've been putting in a big effort. They're going really well. And that, that's a nice example. So a lot of times it feels better in this condition to have the traveler way up, the sheet on hard but you're you're probably going to be stuck in a little bit of a high and, and slow mode you know in this one in this flatter water just barely hiking it's nice pressure flat water we can bring traveler down just a little bit and and sheet on and uh you know one other thing i was thinking about it just we're talking about our finding the balance between how high and how low to have it you know we're very fortunate this winter we i set up a a, a team with two other boats and and we we leave the dock every day together and we go tune together and i think everybody out there you know we all know each other in the fleet and i think it's good to pair up with someone who you're you're familiar with who's about your same level that you can get on the toe together and get off the toe and then go find each other and go go tuning and figure out for that day for that morning that particular race you know what the balance is how much how high do we pull a traveler that feels fast and we can look at because when we're out sailing on our own we can always make the boat feel good but we don't really know how fast we're going so get a buddy tune up get you know two to three boat lengths to weather skippers sight down the transom so the so the both boats are at the same crosswind you know look at each other give it a big go don't get on his wind don't let the guy get back winding you by being on your lee bow tune up and you'll make some then you can make some incremental changes and really learn about how to fine tune for those conditions at that time yeah and that's a great point and in san diego we're very fortunate you know everybody toes out at the same time it's no mystery about when people are going to leave the dock i think the toe leaves at 9 15 and uh if you don't know who to pick just look at the guy across for you from you on the toe say hey you want to line up when we get out there uh let's let's do it you know this is a picture of you eric um let's just highlight your spinnaker sheets first and foremost dangling in the water this was at the uh not good 
at the uh, Midwinters West at the end of April last year, which was a tremendous regatta out in the ocean. One of the best days I've, uh, or regattas I've sailed out there. Yeah, that was and, great. you know, we had big side waves. I think we were with the sheets. We were trying to let you guys catch up. Is yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's us over here just to lure it in ahead, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, we, a uh, condition that we see a lot is where the apparent wind is changing all the time. And it's really important to set the main up for forgiveness. Why don't you talk a little bit about how you achieve that? Yeah, we had a lot of that, uh, this past week in Miami too, because we had a lot of southerly breeze. And when it's southerly, the, uh, the breeze is coming from out in the ocean. Uh, east, southeast in Miami it isn't blocked by either the land itself or Key Biscayne. So we had a lot of, uh, a lot of swell, uh, not as big as in San Diego, but kind of choppy. And the boat had to be very forgiving. So I remember this day in San Diego, there were big swells that we had to go to and then there were big flat spots. So we had to like be pretty dynamic on the main sheet and the traveler. And if we got a big flat spot, the traveler could come down and we could trim it on hard, much like that previous photo with, with uh, Tom Carruthers. And then when it's big swell, big chop coming, the sheet's got to go out a little bit and the traveler's got to come up to keep the power. And that allows the boat when it's, going through the, through the, you know, all the waves. Uh, and then in Miami too, we had a big fleet. We had 56 boats. So especially when you came around the lured mark and all the boats were coming downwind. Oh my God, it was so chopped up. It was terrible. It was one of those times when you're, you're glad you're not driving the boat because it's really, really hard. So everything's got to be forgiving. It's got to be eased. And you know, you, again, like I said earlier, get the power th through the rig tune and the setup. You, you can't over trim in that condition and just kind of lay the boat over. You know, the, the helmsman is the guy who has the best feeling and he, he's got to listen to what the boat tells him through the tiller. It, it has to be easy for him to drive. We had a pretty big breakthrough this weekend where uh, Don had, we hadn't sailed a whole lot, but then this year we got compared to the other guys who have been pushing really hard to go to the world. So Don started feeling very comfortable and he knew, and the boat was talking to him really good. And, and he really calls the trim We're there pulling the lines, but, but the helmsman has the final say, and, and he knew when the boat was too bound up and when it couldn't drive it through the waves correctly, it was just too hard. It would load up and he would just give it a little bit of ease. And that was with the telltale flowing all the time. 100% of the time. There were a lot of times on Sunday, I had the traveler all the way to the top and the sheet was quite eased, quite eased. So the boom was still about in the same spot. It was maybe three or four inches above center line, but the top telltale was always flowing and we've really done nice work on the tune. We had moved our mass butt back just about a quarter inch and we had pulled the rake forward a little bit and the main just looked beautiful. It was very even top to bottom. It looks pretty good in this mode. In this picture as well, a little bit on the firm side, but you know, the it's that's what I was talking about. Getting your tuning partner, having your your small changes to get things right. We had really struggled un until this weekend, and we were able to sail through the fleet. We'd have a bad start or something, get to the top mark at 35th or 30th or something like that. We could go forward and then push push forward in the fleet and finish in the top 15 or 12. I see a little question there from my, would you keep the Vang on to keep the leech tension? And the answer is I've never seen anyone go fast with Vang on and an Etchells with the traveler at, at, at any point going up wind because of how wide the boat is and the traveler, you can adjust it all much easier with the main sheet and it's much quicker. So this is one of those boats where it's there's enough controls with everything else that bank sheeting up wind is is pretty rare, yeah, almost yeah. non-existent. And you talk about a crazy mechanism, man. The mast rim. I, I go down below and I look forward, and there's this crazy robotic arm that's like attached to the boat and attached to the mast. 
bungee you pull cords. on it, it bends the mass stuff. like crazy. And you just, it's, it's hard to know exactly what to do with this thing. And I think that you specifically have taught me uh, how to use this tool very well and very simply put by just looking at the sale, looking at the sale first. Talk about the mass ram and you're searching for power. You want a little bit of head stay sag. How do I know that I've put on enough mass ram and light air? Yeah, we've got we got two pictures here. The uh, first one on the top, Chris Bush sailing in San Diego. You can see everybody's just sitting on the rail, not not quite hiking. Not that Patrick Powell ever hikes very hard anyway. He's usually always <laughs> sitting like that, you know, even when it's really windy. But looking at the main, and we can see these overbend wrinkles just above the windows coming down across the sail, aiming toward the clue at, at about a 45 degree angle. And, and they're not really big, but you can see them. They're, they're, they're prevalent. And you see how they come just to the aft edge of the windows. This is, this is a condition where we're probably going to have to have the mass ram forward just a little bit. We're going to let the sail push. If we pull it all the way back, those are going to completely vanish. The bottom of the sail is going to be very full. The leech is going to be very round. It's going to be very draggy. And we're probably going to have to put the traveler down quite a bit. You know, the, you can, the lighter it gets, the bigger those wrinkles should be, like in the bottom photo. There, everybody's, it's pretty light. You can look in the, in the background there and you see how light it is. But we, we've got to see those, those wrinkles when we're in that condition. We're probably below base on our rig tune. And we, we've got to look at the sail and we got to see those wrinkles so that the sail is not too full, you know, basically from this, from the windows uh, up to the spreader windows. It's helping flatten the, that whole section right there and allows us to trim it on so that the top looks just right, but the bottom is not so round and actually, you know, pointing very high to weather and making the boat feel draggy and slow. So we got to, we, we should, Pay attention to those all the time. Be looking at those wrinkles in the lighter conditions. And then, you know, when we pull that forward, it also sags the forestay a bit. So, you know, we're going to have that discussion too when it comes to jibs, but it's all kind of got to work together. Everything we start, you know, we've got our, we've got the correct sail up. We've got our crew in the right position. We have our rig tune correct. And then we start looking at how we trim the sails. Yeah. And I think, I think you touched on it. It's all relative to the crew position. So if you got everybody in the boat, you probably need more mass pull mass push forward on as people get start to get up on the rail, you can probably look to decrease the amount of push that you have because you want a firmer head stay and you can achieve a flat main through back stay as well. So it's all relative to the crew position. Uh, Eric, uh, I guess you have to be a little careful at times. Sometimes, right, Alex, this is a, this is a picture of Alex coming off the starting line and he clearly has not looked up at the mainsail. Yes. Something happened. Maybe that came out of the cleat or something like that. And we've completely overdone it with the overbend wrinkles. It's going to be tough to go uh, upwind in this. You're probably going really fast through the water, but, but it's not going to be that good VMG for that long. So what do you, what do you think happened here, Alex? I don't know. I think I'm about to learn from Argyle what's true. <laughs> you get you get a little advice. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's hard to pull the mass back coming downwind, and the skipper reaches down and uncleats that so he can get the mass back. And you got to tell the guy, "Hey, I uncleated that, by the way, because you'll go fast for a little bit, but you won't be pointing. The sail will be really, you know, we're talking about small, small changes, and that that right there is a huge change. Huge change. Yeah, that's a little ugly. bit too much. Yeah, long, yeah. Long. I can see from here the four stay sag too, Alex. Maybe that's what you were just looking at. You were just looking at the jib. You've got four people. You should let other people trim that sail. <laughs> well, everybody's got an opinion on our boat. That's for sure. <laughs> so, so this is just uh, this picture just talks a little bit. This is a carryover from or an old slide from a heavy air webinar that Eric and I did. But you can tell just you know the different ways to see a full versus flat sail. So on the left, the sail is fuller because there aren't as many overbend wrinkles. The sail just looks a lot, you know, livelier, I guess you could say. 
Uh, the the uh, boat on the right is Benj. He notoriously sails very flat. His overbend wrinkles are going from the spreader down into the clue. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of how you can tell from pictures if if one's full or flat. It's, and when Eric and I are sitting in a debrief and we're looking at, at several hundred pictures throughout the course of a day and it's hard to analyze because the shapes are so close, the way we trim is so close. These are some of the visual cues that we look at when we look at pictures when it comes to full versus flat. So I thought that, that that'd be prudent to share with kind of the greater masses um, on how we actually uh, analyze some of these pictures. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing, we're, we're predominantly a light air venue, San Diego, it's rare we see, you know, over 14 knots. So in general, we're, we're looking for power a lot of times. We probably have the mass butt back a little bit further. And we're a lot of times we'll probably have the ram on all the way back against the aft part of the mass collar. But when it gets windy, we want to pull more and more backstay on to help settle the rig down, to help flatten the main. Well, at some point, when it gets so windy, we we you know we want that forestay really tight. We're, we're sagging away and if we end up looking like Benj here 1427 if we get he's at max backstay right there is basically what I'm trying to say he's probably all the way back against the collar he cannot pull the backstay on anymore because his main will go inside out it looked like that previous photo we had with Alex so in that case we're out there it happens in the spring it happens quite a bit and in, in every couple of years we get a real windy regatta or in, in san diego in our spring series big wind big waves a lot of fun and if your four stay is too loose and you got you can't pull any more back stay on you might have to push the mass butt forward a little bit you know push it forward like a, a quarter of an inch or something like that to help pull the back stay on harder and settle down the main so you don't get any more over bend wrinkles than than uh, what the 1427 has there that's that's a well, classic sign you know we've in, in general i know guys they, they leave their mass butt in the same spot all the time because it's san diego it's it's uh it's 90 percent of the time you do like that but in those days when the when the big wind comes and you want to pull that back stay on really hard you might have to push it forward a little bit you know or conversely you could take a couple turns up on the head stay as well and that'll help pull the rig forward so i just want to throw that in there but you can pretty much change everything on the actuals, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't like it's kind of one thing at a time. You know, if you've got the rig tight enough, you're up one step or two steps, everybody's hiking hard, out hauls on, Cunningham's on, back stays on, and the four stays still bouncing around. You got that big overbend wrinkle. You're gonna have to change something so that you can pull the back stay on harder. So either you're gonna and if you're all the way back against the collar in the mass partners, it's either got to be the mass butt or the four stay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we we've definitely given everybody a lot of information on the mains. And I think that one of the things that we've taken away um, uh, in Miami this this past winter is how to simplify where the lead position should be relative to the amount of head stay sag that you have. And one of the things that we've learned is the more head, you know, you with the mal up. You can sag the head stay a little bit more, but you have to match the lead moving outboard. Uh, uh, kind of the two work together. So on the left, this is us last race on Sunday, which was quite a nice race. Like Eric said, six to 11 knots. Um, we're definitely on the verge of being too soft on our head stay. Um, this is more of like a traditional LM2L type of look where you can see you know, a lot of the mass is exposed um, versus uh, Jim Cunningham and their team who just won the series and was second in the regatta. They're sailing with a straighter head stay and they're hiking really hard. So the, the straighter the head stay, the more the lead can come inboard. The softer the head stay, the more the lead needs to stay outboard. Um, Eric, you've done some sailing with the LM6R. It's obviously a little bit fuller, but why don't you talk a little bit about that sale? Because it is a little bit more complicated than the mount. Well, it's a little bit harder sale to trim. It's a little fuller. It's easier to shut it down, and it, and it, and it likes a tighter head stay. 
you know, when I used to drive the boat in San Diego with the old setup, I, I really worked hard at looking at the forestay and I had a really good feel because we sagged the forestay so much that from the skipper, it would, it, a lot of it would disappear behind the mast. So I would really work hard to sit in the same spot and look up and see where it was vanishing behind the mast. And I had a really good feel for that. And I knew that it, you know, where it needed to be for the boat to go fast. And now we're starting to inhaul. We're starting, and that helps the boat point higher. But when the, when the clue of the jib comes up, you know, the luff of the jib, you know, if the leech comes up, the luff has to come up as well. It makes sense. Before when we trimmed outside in the cutty cabin, that, that the sheeting angle is way outside. It, it's like 12 or 14 degrees. If you, if you look at the some photos in Seahorse Magazine or from big regattas with uh, mini maxis and TP-52s, I mean, the, the jib's almost touching the main at the mast. The guys are trimming inside four degrees, you know, and that, that's kind of how the light bulb went off for the Australian guys who, who said, why don't we trim a lot, you know, a lot narrower, started moving it up. You know, we had to sag the forestay because the leech was so far outside. So if the leech is way out, well, the luff's got to be way out. So now we've moved the luff in. We've moved the leech in. We got to move the luff in a little bit too. And especially with the LM6R, it can handle an even tighter forestay. The sail's quite full. You know, when you tighten the forestay, it flattens the jib a little bit. So if your boat is set up and you've got, you know, you prefer a much firmer forestay, you probably want to have an LM6R because that sail will, will match it nicely. It can't absorb as much sag. It gets quite knuckly forward. It's kind of a narrow groove and it's and it's hard to steer. You know, if there's waves, that's a problem. So it's it's a little bit fuller down low than the Mal. You know, we probably sell 60, 70% Mal's and the rest LM6Rs. It's because it's a little bit, a little bit more forgiving sail. Um, doesn't have quite as much power as the LM6R. And they're both, you can win with both of them. But those would be the things I would think about, you know, if you're if you still have outboard leads you know you're probably going to want to have the mal because it can it can handle a little bit more force day but the lm6r is definitely a nice powerful sail but don't oversag the force day and and i'm really trying to figure out crewing and with the tighter force day you know sitting in the same spot and looking up and trying to reference you know we we can sit here and talk about force day sag all day and show you pictures but how do we do it when we're on the boat how do we reference the amount that we have you know, I trim the main. You know, I, I sit in the exact same spot, with like my butt cheeks just over the rail. I sit straight up and I and I look up at the jib and I see where it's intersecting the forestay. And basically, we all have marks on our spreaders. And I found from where I sit, my height on our boat, the head stay has to be about halfway between the mast and the innermost mark on the weather spreader. And when it's there, I know I'm in a I'm in a good ballpark. If it's way inside of that i know i've got too much force stay sag it's, it's kind of hard to do but really work on that i i suggest the skippers and the main trimmers because you have a good view of it and and reference sitting in these it's hard because if you move just a little bit in or a little bit out i just sit straight up and down my foot's on the on the barney post just right where the main sheet is and i i look at it and i'm trying to reference that so i can reproduce that because that's the hardest thing to reproduce. When I see that, I look back. Also, if I, you know, we're fortunate, we have a coach and he says, oh, that's the max you can have. I've got a mark in the back. I know it's a little green piece of thread and I, I can't ease the back stay any further than that. That's that's my first reference. And then the second one is looking up at the spreader and that's our, that's our setting for what we're comfortable with, we think is fast. Yeah, and we, so in a four person team, a lot of times, you know, in the lighter air, the jib trimmers in the tank commander position where they're kind of in our jib trimmers, Mark Ivy, who's very experienced in these boats. And he just watches the head stay pulse and he'll communicate with me as the guy who controls the head stay sag as the main trimmer. He'll say, okay, the head stay seems a little, little firm, or a little soft or something like that. Or, you know, if we're struggling a little bit for speed and it's really pulse pulsing, he'll be like, Hey, maybe let's take a little bit of head stay sag, sag out or move the jib lead out, you know, to try and match it. 
So the, again, the crew coordination of the people all working together, knowing your own specific job and how to work with the others in the boat is all really important. And so uh, there's multiple ways to do it. Lucas Calabrese, really excellent natural sailor. He taught me to go against the boom and kind of lean against the boom and watch the head stay kind of pulse. And that'd be a good gauge on how to do it. There's so many different ways out there, but I think the way that Eric does it where the head stay intersects, that's a really good repeatable way that you can do every day. So, um, and then this is just, this talks, this is, you know, there's really no differences here. This just shows how far inboard the leads are. The leads used to be, you know, way, kind of out here on the rail, as we know, what everybody probably on this webinar used to sail with the LM2L outside in San Diego. And this just shows how far inboard we've, we've moved. Both these boats are using MAL jibs. And uh, even with the MAL, you're sheeting at, you know, eight, nine degrees of, of uh, sheeting angle. So it, it's, it's drastically changed. And it's, made the boat more fun to sail, in my opinion, and, and definitely the racing a lot tighter. And as I found out this weekend, sometimes you think you can tack and cross a guy, but these boats, they point so high that you tack and you wind up hitting Chris Larson. So, you know, you gotta, <laughs> you got, it's just really neat, fun sailing. And the, and the series has been just a joy to be a part of. So nothing really to show here in this uh in this slide other than how far inboard and to tie in the last uh slide of you know the more head stay sag you need or you have the more the lead needs to move out towards the cutty as the head stay gets straighter definitely reference the tuning guide and uh on on the max inboard and just have nice marks on the deck you know or if you're using the dog track system uh, putting numbers on the dog track. So everything's repeatable and you can go to the same spot on both sides and uh, just kind of keep things as simple as possible because this boat's really hard and complicated to figure out. Yeah, you know, I had a question uh, come up earlier too that uh, someone had asked if, if uh, you know, coming out of tax, teams are, are moving the more, the lead outboard to help the boat accelerate. And then as it gets up to speed, pulling it in, and I, I haven't seen anybody do that. Uh, this last weekend was probably the, the first time, well, it's the most active we've been on the jib leads, uh, where if, if we would be a, a bit overstood on the starboard ley line or we'd get a big lift and wanted to go over somebody, we would immediately drop it down about two inches, you know, almost to where how we used to sail to get some speed going. But, or if the boat, felt really sluggish and it was hard to drive and a problem we'd slide it out just a little bit if the water were flatter in general in the beginning of the day we would kind of try and find a max inboard spot where it would be and and I like Alex's hey let's let's keep it simple but there are times San Diego we like the right sometimes we end up on the right there's big righties out there we get on the ley line and we have to be overstood and and you can't really ease the sheet on the etchels more than about two or three inches any more than that we we look at the top of the sail the bottom of the sail looks really nice the middle's okay but the head's just totally open and, it, and it's not even pulling it just starts to luff and we think it looks great so that's a situation where we keep the sheet on and we just move the lead all the way outboard just pull the thing all the way down if we're up on that starboard ley line and we're in a nice puff and we're we see some boats coming and we're 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 super confident we're going to lay the weather mark because we're overstood and there's going to be nice wind. We might have to, we can drop that lead and gain that extra couple, you know, half a boat length or something so that the guy can't tack inside of us or we just go over them. So we definitely did that three or four times uh, this past weekend in Miami. Just drop that lead down, the skipper lean on it a bit, crack the sheet just an inch, make sure the top of the sail is working. We don't want to take our foot off the gas. We, we need every bit of power we can with this boat. We all know that. So let's not give it away. Yeah. Very well put. And, and then lastly, we've talked about the technical aspects of this fine vessel. Uh, but the whole goal of any light air setup is to get the guys on the rail and to start hiking. You want to create load to get the team up there and then hike it flat. And, um, 
once you get to that point of, okay, now we're hiking really hard. We're hiking as hard as we can. We've done the simple things to depower the boat. That's when we go on, start to go on on the rig and start to, you know, pull the ram aft and pull the back, stay hard till we start to see the overbend wrinkles. And then that's when you come on in and you take a look at me and Eric's webinar from last year on heavy air setup. And then you're able to just kind of tie it all together. Yeah, I, I, I see a lot of times or I'm, I'm surprised that we're kind of sailing along with someone and it's, it's not that windy. We're all kind of relaxed and a puff comes and someone eases the traveler or they ease the main sheet to keep the boat on its feet. And just the first words out of your mouth and your first reaction should be hike and lean out, right? We want to use that riding moment of the boat. We, we're, we're carrying these bodies around. That, that can move and could hike. We, we want to use the power. Don't ease anything to flatten the boat out until everybody's hiked. Use that power, every, every bit of power you got. And then once everybody's hiked all the time, then we start thinking about depowering. And what does it have to be? That's, that's a good question. It depends how long the puff is going to be. Is it going to be a permanent, you know, big puff it's going to take a long time it was really interesting because i was sailing the midwinters a couple of weeks ago in my star boat with my buddy payson and it was we were max hike max hike and a puff would come and maybe it was short-lived maybe it was long maybe i wanted to go over somebody and i pulled a little more out haul or maybe i pulled the cunning ham or maybe i pulled the back stay but the big thing i learned in that that weekend was it didn't really matter what i did as long as I kept the boat sailing on its on its feet at the same angle, it, it, there's no magic number of what's gonna what's magic adjustment that makes it. it's it's about the feel in the helm and keeping the boat on angle. We we can't pinch too much because the boat wants to go. If, if the boat is just stuck in a high and you know thin mode and we're always inside the telltale we can't lean on the on the telltale and sail on it because the boat lays over too much we got to do something we just keep the boat on the correct angle max power and then got to be easy to sail let the boat do the work so we can look around and race right if we're focusing so hard and keeping the boat going it's probably not set up quite right we got to ease everything just a little bit but we got to look around and be racing as well and in light air, what's the key about racing, Alex? What do you do first? Go fast. And go for the wind. All about the wind. Get to the wind. If our head's in the boat and we're depowered and we're not going fast, we're not looking around to find all the pressure, go fast to the pressure. Yeah. Don't sail in the middle. Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, this webinar is going to go up into the uh, North Sales Archive on YouTube. There's webinars on all sorts of things how to sail to and from catalina with your light air gen or light air jenniker it's uh you know eric's got at least 15 or 20 uh star webinars on there where he just talks about spreader sweep and uh, shroud angle and weird stuff like that um there i think there's three or four from uh, the etchels as well so thank you everybody for uh tuning in this evening and uh eric We'll see you a couple in a couple weeks. Good luck in the Bacardi, and uh, see you down there right. in Miami for the uh, North Americans. Thanks, everybody. All right, bye. Take care.